welcome all of you to this version of our special programs for those involved in the uh, uh, Tennessee Higher Education Innovation and Leadership Fellows Program and the University of Tennessee Executive Leadership Institute. This session is called Nimble Adaptability in the New Normal World of COVID-19. And it is a wonderful, wonderful pleasure to have uh, two presenters who we're really introducing to our program because they are uh, somewhat outsiders. Uh, first, we'll start with Scott Wilson, who is the Vice President for Corporate Communications and Community Relations at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee in Chattanooga, and a very good friend to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And then a new person to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, having arrived in August, and as uh, I said, as a reward, for her coming to Tennessee, the uh, chancellor appointed her to be in charge of COVID responses. Dr. Deborah Crawford is uh, vice chancellor for research at the University of Tennessee at, at Knoxville. And so with that, Scott, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, looking forward to what you have accomplished with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. So thank you very much for having me again. Uh, Scott Wilson, I'm I work in corporate communications and uh, community relations, uh, which means uh, internal and external communications. And uh, I'm involved with our foundation, so our charitable giving, which also includes our, uh, what we call Team Blue, which is our volunteer workforce. Um, this uh, presentation isn't so much about how we got home, it's what we had to do after we got everyone home. So. At Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, as you know, um, we're the state's largest healthcare uh, provider. And um, we, if there are two Tennesseans in the room, chances are one of them, uh, we, we arrange their healthcare services. So um, it's a big obligation. And so our immediate, when COVID hit immediately, we knew we had to get everyone home because um, if we came to a standstill, so would a lot of the health services, especially for, you know, we're one of the, uh, we manage the state's um, 10 care program, which we call Blue Care. So uh, in the middle of a health care crisis, keeping our people well and healthy was important. And in Chattanooga, we had 5,000 people basically in one place. Um, I should say that also, over time of our 6,800 people, <clears throat> 2,000 had already been tr transitioned to work from home. So we had some experience in how to do this. And uh, there's a whole lot of people like me who pick up your laptop and go home every night anyway. So, um, but we, uh, when you, that's one thing, but when you're going to be working full time there, you need screens, chairs. There was a whole logistical um, program to get everyone home and we did it really really quickly one of the great things of having your CEO also be um, a physician uh, JD uh, Hickey our CEO is a uh, he's a lawyer and a doctor and um, of course he um, is uh, a business professional and he saw this coming in January so he had us ready to go and really in a matter of weeks we were working from home but when that happened, and let me, uh, sorry, that did not, there we go. Um, we, we had a whole new set of uh, issues because we've worked for years at Blue Cross to be a, a great place to work. And that translates into fantastic customer service. People are happy at Blue Cross. Um, and a lot of it has to do with amenities. We have a beautiful workplace. We have fitness and, and a medical center and a pharmacy. And, you know, I mean, um, if you've ever been to our campus, it really is a wonderful place to work with beautiful views of mountains and rivers and, and walking paths outside. Um, but working in your kitchen during a pandemic is a different thing. So first we had to get everyone home um, and uh, we wanted to, we didn't know if it was going to be weeks, months. Turns out it's going to be more than a year. 
Um, but we needed people, we wanted to be my, bimodal. We wanted everything still being at work, but we wanted people to be able to instantly work from home. Um, and then, of course, culture is important, as I just mentioned. We, uh, my team was tasked with um, communicating to maintain culture um, and to create ways for people to feel that same connection as if they were at work. Um, I'm going to stop and just quickly show you because in previous presentations, this was uh, something I mentioned in passing and people were really intrigued with. So we measure our engagement, alignment and agility and a bunch of other things. I chose these three uh, every year and it's phenomenal. I've worked in many situations. I worked in manufacturing for eight years and I can tell you these scores in a manufacturing setting are nothing like this. Um, so we have always had great scores um, and it came time to do our engagement survey uh, during in the middle of COVID. And we went ahead with it because what better time to find out how you're doing than a crisis. And the good news for us is, as you can see, these scores, uh, engagement, um, how your, your pride, energy and optimism that fuels your above and beyond effort, not just getting your job done, but that extra bit of you that you put into it. It went up 3% to an unbelievable 96%. Um, and alignment, something we can measure against our industry, um, again, already good, also went up 3%, which is 22 points above our industry average, which again goes to that, uh, that culture that's been created at our company. Uh, and agility. Um, I'm not at all surprised this one went up because they were, they were seeing our agility. We, <laughs> we, you know, we were uh, happily working um, at, at our office in February and at home in March. And um, so that, that it went up 7%, I, I rather expected it because uh, it was a really impressive effort involving mostly IT uh, people in the garage, handing out monitors. You could come get your chair. They had a whole assembly line of socially distanced masked handoff of equipment uh, that went really, really well and got us uh, home and working. Incidentally, I'll add, after about three weeks, months of working from home, we resurveyed our employees and said, as I mentioned, 2,000 of the 6,800 were already working from home permanently. Um, that had gone up, I'll say over a, like a four year period that's been going up. And we asked them, you've been working from home. Do you like it? Would you like to do it full time? And as of now, we are 55% permanent work from home of people who think they can be effective and um, so we're letting them. There was some resistance over the years. Um, I, don't, I don't like to generalize, but I'll just say uh, maybe the baby boom generation felt more comfortable where they could see their employees. And as you get younger, you get more comfort away from that. Um, and uh, so we sort of gave our management team a nudge and um, it's, working out fine, which they now know because they've had to do it. So uh, it's, uh, people are happy working from home, those that have chosen to, so we can accommodate it. Let me Excuse forward. me, Scott, this, yes. this is Bruce Lamatina from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I just had a really quick question. It's a, a fascinating uh, uh, measures that you have there. And I think you may have alluded to it, but can you just, just explain for just a second on how, how you come up with those indexes and how they're measured? Is it, is it all, is it a survey, internal survey? We or? survey 100, yes, 100% uh, of our employees are surveyed. It is anonymous. It is conducted by a third party. Um, and we've been doing it for, well, we've been surveying for a very long time, but using these measures through this company for uh, six or seven years. I was with Blue Cross for seven years. Uh, I went to the Volkswagen launch for eight or nine years, and then they asked me to come back and, uh, sort of turn around our foundation in 2018. Um, so I wasn't involved there for a few years, but um, yeah, so these measures uh, are conducted by a third party and then handed back to us. And then we hold meetings with our employees and talk through them. And um, there's a place where they can give, uh, it's open-ended and they can say whatever they want. And our management, and believe me, when you open that up, people will respond. 
Um, it's mostly positive, but we get a lot of suggestions for change and um, we implement a lot of them as well. Um, I could give examples. Um, sometimes they're big, sometimes they're little. Um, had to, uh, sec I need a second monitor, so we open that up for people. I want a standing desk. Um, some people, <laughs> there was a, a couple complaints of after washing my hands, there's water dripped on the floor under the, um, where the paper towels are. And so now in every bathroom, there's a rubber mat under that. It seems small, but it's easy to respond to that. Um, and one, we had a, this beautiful walking track at the top of Cameron Hill that has these just amazing views of Chattanooga downtown. Um, <clears throat> but we got complaints from some of our female employees that their heels would sink in. It had this sort of crushed gravel, the really, really tiny gravel. Never occurred to me because I don't wear heels at work. Um, and uh, so we, we, we paved it and put a rubber coating on it. And, you know, I mean, we were just responsive to our employees, but it comes from these surveys. These measures you're looking at on this screen are also from that survey. Um, I think that the um, understanding how my work contributes to Blue Cross being at 98% shows a really engaged workforce. Um, and then that last measure is one we also care about um, because uh, there's a huge, there's a lot of people fighting for trained employees these days and 96% of our people say they don't intend to leave. So um, did that, is that enough of an answer for your question? Is that? Yes, thank you. That's fantastic. Appreciate Great, it. thanks. So, um, <clears throat> Once we got home, uh, and I'm gonna skip ahead and come back to this. Once we got home, oh, I'm going the wrong direction, sorry. Uh, this is the program Forward Together that my team put together to manage uh, being working from home and the reintegration back to work. It, we, we thought we were coming back sooner. That's not the case. So it became Forward Together was meant uh, like everything after we return, what's, what's life in the campus going to be like? Masks, distancing, those who are working from home, that new workforce, but it became managing working from home. So I'm going to go back um, to this slide. A lot of things, what we realized is once we got home and we started talking to people and <clears throat> Another thing I need to mention, we have a, an extremely re robust internal web uh, intranet. Daily stories, each story, people can rate that story with emojis and leave feedback. <clears throat> so we have a lot of feedback loops um, and we encourage our upper management to make sure that if there's questions being asked, they're answering it. So what we learned from this feedback and we surveyed was that working from home isn't like it because kids were there too, right? Everyone was home. So we, these are the measures that we put in place based on employee feedback. Um, if you needed certain times uh, to help kids, you know, we, we, we told our management, just be flexible. My team, they're writers. I told them they can write at night. I don't care, you know, make it work for you. Um, we don't harass anyone if, um, if you're not at your desk at 10 a.m. As long as things are getting done, we, you know, we, we, we're trying to be flexible here. We had to encourage people to take paid time off because um, they weren't doing it. And as of now, we're actually ahead of last year. Um, we, we have a really great um, fitness program at work, a modern gym yoga in, in some common areas during the day. So we had to transition that to home, which um, was initially just like an online, you could just get with our fitness team who were in our fitness center. But then we um, hired, we partnered with some of these people to offer um, free online fitness programs, tutoring services for children, childcare and elder care services uh, available to our employees and then this library of online activities to keep the kids engaged. Some other things we did, no meetings after 4 p.m. We heard from people that there was this transition from work to home life around four where the kids are getting antsy and <clears throat> it just 
didn't work. So it, it's not that they're not working if they want or need to. It's that we, we're not scheduling meetings where they're being pulled away. Um, and as we, we were noticing a whole lot of parental stress. And so again, some of those services we put in place that, uh, with that next slide. Um, I'm trying to, the enhanced management training for remote workplace. So this is something, we have a, a management portal that um, we were really pushing a lot of work from home training, um, a lot more check-ins with your employees than you might be used to as you walk up and down the aisles. We made sure that our managers took <clears throat> some of the trainings, made some of them mandatory because <clears throat> uh, this was a whole new paradigm of managing remotely and we want to make sure that they were ready to do that. And I think I need to speed up here. Again, I wanted you to see some of the partners that we chose just so that it wasn't, um, that it was, these are real world partnerships we put in place and we got a lot of positive feedback from our employees and I was really impressed uh, how many people are using it. Okay, so forward together. Again, uh, highest level, you see JD Hickey over there on the right and uh, our chief medical officer, we implemented initially a lot of communications, a lot of videos pushed to our intranet um, where they were daily discussing changes uh, in, in the COVID situation, safety measures, um, and just trying to make sure we were in touch with everyone. Again, this is part of the effort for returning to the workplace. We do have um, what we call the lights on team. We didn't use any language like um, you're a, a, an important employee or a, um, we, this language is, doesn't make anyone feel good. So uh, lights on team is how we referred to the people who, so we have a bank of computers that are very important because we're a tech company now. Every interaction we have, customers, physicians, pharmacies, all of it, behavioral health, it's all digital. So keeping those people healthy was extremely important. And we have a lot of measures in place to keep the lights on team healthy. And um, that's why we, had, we are keeping people away from campus. This forward together uh, gift box mailer was something we did late summer um, when we realized this is gonna go on for a while. We mailed this home to all our employees when masks were becoming a big deal. Um, so that's a, a stone coaster for um, beverages became a, a big topic of discussion. So um, everyone got this box with a note from our CEO and a, a couple branded um, face masks, which you see on uh, an employee and a child there. And our employees started posting pictures of themselves wearing them. Uh, they were uh, really grateful for this effort. We also, again, so my, my, my communications team was thinking, how can we keep people engaged in communicating about one another during this? So we started a high five program where employees would tell us about what their colleagues were doing to help our customers and to keep their team engaged. Um, so that became a big deal to uh, send your friend a high five and get it uh, put onto our platform for internal recognition and then we started a daily no it's not daily it's a weekly video program called good news blue the initial logo was drawn by the uh the thumbs up guy there he's the host he um has a lot of stand-up comedian in him um i think he's done a lot of improv work uh in his spare time because it's a really amusing program uh, i'd be happy to share a video if anyone's interested later but what he that's from his home and he would just sort of give the news of the day and a feature, feature an employee and generally some corporate program that was happening, um, whether it was pandemic related or not, just again, to, to make sure everyone was feeling connected to their culture. Um, yeah, and so we also, normally we have, after that engagement survey, we have town halls uh, held throughout our system across the state where people can gather live. So obviously that wasn't working. So we held them online and you can see the live streaming increased participation by 95%. Um, so if I had to guess, that's probably something that'll be kept in place going forward because um, uh, we got, we reached a whole lot more employees that way. Um, 
And um, so we have on our, pro, um, on our platform a share at work. That's a, an initiative where all those things I told you about earlier, the walking paths, all those ideas come through share at work. We also have them related to how can we make the customer experience better? How can we, uh, you know, I mean, so we put business pr uh, problems up for employees to help solve and, and we can, they can put ideas forward, but we also put um, internal things forward. And so we, when we did that, we got 601 ideas um, with, and you can see the number of comments and votes there. Um, so that has been a, uh, a very useful program during this um, pandemic. We also, purely coincidentally, were simultaneous to the pandemic hitting, launching a, a new app called Go Blue, so that we were on their phones, which as you know, for our younger generations, especially, not exclusively, but uh, they, that's how they want to interact. And so that we were expecting maybe 10 f for it to grow slowly. And we were instantly at like 50% of um, our 55% uh, uh, of our employees engaged with that. We also mailed home early on some uh, yard signs. Uh, the reverse has a, a message as well. Um, th there was a big push where we were sending meals uh, to hospitals across the state and the employees, they're still up um, and it's, it's strange here in my neighborhood. I live in an inner city neighborhood in Chattanooga and I, I, I had no idea how many Blue Cross people live blocks away. Um, one on my block, uh, he, to be fair, had just moved in. But um, so it, that's been a, a great program as well. So and, and lastly, I know I'm taking too much time. In the middle of this pandemic, of course, the, um, the whole country went through um, the uh, issue with uh, racism and injustice that um, that hit with the death of Mr. Floyd. And um, this hit our employees really hard and, and everyone, of course. And so we launched a series of programs. Um, I, I, my boss uh, and upper management told us they, that we want to make a serious effort, not just token efforts. And so we made initially, we took out full page ads to state our corporate stand against racism and things like that. But internally, we started holding a series of programs. And I think <clears throat> um, it's detailed here, but where we just opened Zoom calls and let 150 people at a time sign up um, and this was really in, in the weeks where the whole country was uh, de dealing with this every day in the media. And um, we had these very uncomfortable, very forthright conversations that were really just listening sessions. Our CEO and our chief diversity officer um, just basically would open up and, and state our stand against racism, um, which candidly, we have a very we're not new to this. We have a really strong culture of diversity and inclusion. Um, and starting with when our CEO took over, he made the diversity and inclusion officer, pulled him from HR in the org chart and put him directly as a direct report to the CEO um, so that these things uh, were taken seriously and easily implemented. And he's done a lot. His name is Ron Harris. Uh, it's possible many of you uh, may know him because he presents often across the state. So we held eight of those sessions, um, 150 people at a time, just telling their story and listening to stories and asking questions. Um, then we started a series of videos where upper management, uh, people of color, um, would tell their stories. And they're, they're quite startling. Um, vice presidents on their way to work you know, in an Acura in a suit and tie pulled over uh, and put up against the car because the police were just looking for a black person in the area. You know, just horrible stories that a lot of people just had no idea happened to uh, our colleagues. Um, and um, a lot of uh, our female colleagues telling stories about how they have to talk to their sons about how to drive and be in public. And um, it was really, startling of course and you all went through the same thing I won't belabor this but um, so then we so we after the 
management um, video series, we opened it up to everyone where they could film their own. And we have a portal online where those stories are still going on. Um, we started a radio program, a series uh, locally um, with the uh, Urban League, um, where we talk about these things and that's still ongoing. Uh, I had the honor of just participating in the second to last of those programs. Um, and uh, finally, yeah, that's uh, Ron Harris there. Um, I, so at the end of this, we, we surveyed again and um, our employees, as you can see, 100% recommended to their coworkers that they sign up. Uh, and uh, these are some of the comments they stated. So um, it, we're, we got a lot of great feedback from our employees for taking this stand. And to be candid, we got negative feedback because we pushed all these messages out through our broker system as well to make sure that people who are selling our product in the market know how we feel. And not everyone who, you know, they are third party, not everyone feels that way. And we got some negative feedback, which we answered candidly, we're not changing our stance. You are welcome to disagree with us, but um, we're not, we're not changing it. And um, I think some a couple backed away and that's fine. Um, there are other people who can do that, but uh, I was really pleased that our corporation took this stance. I've gone on too long. I'm going to uh, st stop now uh oh last thing we did our employees had these ideas juneteenth is now a company holiday it does not replace a holiday it is its own um additional holiday starting this uh, uh this juneteenth um we instituted mandatory um un unconscious bias training has been available for years ron's been doing it um but now it's mandatory for everyone uh which was an employee request for those who've been through it um, and we have, again, this employee forum uh, that's ongoing discussing uh, minorities in corporate America. I think I'm done. Yeah, thanks very much. And let me unshare my screen. Great. Thanks, Scott. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Crawford, and uh, then we'll have Q&A following her presentation. Thanks, Scott. Deborah? Hi, everyone. I hope you can, hope you can see my, my screen here. Um, I'm delighted to join you all this morning. Thanks so much, Bob, for inviting me to participate in this session. Um, I'm Deb Crawford, as, as Bob described, I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research here at the University of Tennessee, and I'm going to sort of share this morning my experiences um, as a university leader, first at George Mason University in Northern Virginia, um, an institution where I was the Vice President for Research through uh, August this year, um, when I took my appointment at the University of Tennessee. And um, I'm going to sort of share with you some of my experiences in responding to and navigating this extraordinary year of COVID created chaos and, and in some cases loss. Um, and I'm going to draw on a, on a framework described in two papers by McKinsey and you see those at the bottom of my slide here um, that you feel free to take a look at later. So first to sort of paint the backdrop. Um, on March 7, 2020, I traveled to Knoxville, actually, from Northern Virginia um, for two reasons. I was interviewing for a job here at the University of Tennessee, the job I now hold, and I was attending a board meeting of the Oak Ridge Associated Universities, where I've been a board member for a couple of years. I arrived on the Saturday. Um, I had my interview at UT, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and I went to the board meeting Wednesday. Um, Thursday morning, I got up. Um, for the second day of the board meeting and I had an email um, from the president at the George Mason University saying, Deb, we need you to come into the office today if you can. Can you return from, from Tennessee? Um, I hopped in my car and drove back to Northern Virginia uh, to learn. I got there early afternoon to learn that the university had been in conversations with the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia and it was time to sort of think about the university's response to the emerging pandemic. Um, so that was sort of my introduction, sort of happened all of a sudden, um, 
and and here here I am. Um, did I think I just there we go. That's better. So to give you a sense of what was happening in Northern Virginia at that time, um, the region experienced a very dramatic growth in the in the um, transmission of the virus. So you, I'm showing you here by uh, the third week in March, we had um, 16 fatalities in one day. We were seeing enormous rise in the, the number of positive diagnoses. Um, and what you can see here on this slide is, you know, over the March through the end of June period in Northern Virginia, more than a thousand fatalities. Um, the positive rate um, for, for those who were able to get tested, which was a very small portion of the community, um, you know, approached 40% uh, the first couple of weeks in April. So really significant growth in cases and unfortunately followed by a really sig significant number of fatalities. Um, so, th so that was sort of the backdrop for what we were seeing. Um, I go back to, to Northern Virginia and, and I'm meeting with the, it was the president, the provost, myself and the CFO. And the first thing that president says to us is, you know, like we, we need to get on the phone. We need to be talking with as many of our colleagues as possible. Deb, you have, you have connections with NIH and the CDC. Can you give your counterparts there a call? And we were dispatched to, to um, contact our counterparts at the other Virginia institutions. Um, and basically we were collecting intelligence. What is everybody else? seeing and doing what should the institution uh, be thinking about taking as its first action. Now, at that time, it turns out that the week of March 8th was actually spring break at George Mason University. So we didn't have many students on campus that week and most of our faculty were not on campus too. So it was a fairly light week for us. The basketball team was about to go and play in the Atlantic 10. Um, competition in New York City that following weekend where of course there was a growing dramatic growth in the number of cases being being diagnosed in New York City. So that was sort of the environment in which we were working at the time. The, the president decided that we needed to pull together what she called her kitchen cabinet. It was the four of us who met on that Thursday afternoon, plus the vice president for communications and marketing. And then we formed a number of pretty small teams to help us think about, okay, what, where, where do we focus? Um, how do we respond to this? Recognizing that we have 7,000 students returning to our residences um, the following week um, and another 23,000 students returning to in-person classes. Um, we were worried about uh, the impact of a move to what was likely to be remote work, at least for some period of time. And like Scott, we thought that this might last you know, anywhere from two to eight weeks, we certainly weren't envisioning um, the, the experiences we've all had since that time. Um, but we were planning for a fairly extended absence from campus. And so we involved our information technology group, um, largely because they had to make some very significant changes in operational support um, for, the, for our campus activities. I was involved, we had a significant on-campus lab-based research operation that doesn't shut down during spring break. Um, and we had to think about, well, if we end up going to a shelter in place drill, and that's what we expected to do, that was the messaging we were getting from the governor's office, that we were likely headed to a shelter in place for a limited period of time, we would need to put all of our research labs into hibernation. Um, and think about how we would start the new semester scheduled to start the next week, if we were to have to go to an all online learning modality. So, so we pulled together this group, five, this group, five groups of fairly small teams, each with between three and six individuals on them to help advise the Kitchen Cabinet of what to do next. This larger group of individuals met the following week, twice a day, um, 
both collecting intelligence, sharing ideas of what we might do next, um, and um, brainstorming on the fly, right? We were worried, we weren't quite worried about logistics issues at that time and access to supplies. We were mostly concerned about what are we going to do when students return to campus in the coming days. Um, at the beginning of, at the end of the week, um, so that's the end of the week of March 8th, we determined we were going to extend spring break just by ourselves time. We extended spring break by a week that allowed this group of people to engage more in thinking about how we get through the following month. It turns out that all of our meeting together um, for that week when actually most of the rest of campus had been asked to work from home um, resulted in some transmission of the virus and a good number of us actually were diagnosed um, positive. Like I was, our, our president was, our president is married to our uh, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia, uh, state senator, and um, uh, so they made a public announcement about their diagnosis, which is why I can share it here, but we had more than half of the people on our early response team actually contract the virus. Now, um, we were extremely fortunate. None of us had very serious cases that required hospitalization, but most of us experienced the symptoms that are sort of that debilitating fatigue um, and, and different aspects of the symptoms. Now, I think most of my colleagues who had um, light symptoms um, didn't realize they had the virus, right? At that time, we believed that you had to have a fever. The symptoms were much more narrowly defined at that time. And so there wasn't a full understanding of the extent to which the virus had traveled through our early response team. We weren't wearing masks at the time. That was not recommended by the CDC. We were physically distancing, but we were gathering in groups. I mean, you can see here, we would typically, our, our beginning and end of day meetings would involve anywhere from 25 to 35 individuals. And, but we would be in a very large conference room. So it was fairly easy to achieve the six feet physical distancing, clearly, the masks were very necessary to limit virus transmission. Now, how did we get through that with so many of us feeling poorly? Well, it turns out that during that period, we also had begun to expand our network of teams, right? So we began to understand that we needed to have a much larger group of people involved, those of us involved at the kitchen cabinet level. And in the first group of teams, um, we didn't know enough to make sound decisions about how the university needed to approach this and so we had expanded the universe of those involved and at that time we had the good sense to actually insist on more online meetings and very much less of a presence on our campus um, so that sort of that mitigated the problem that in fact in this sort of more inner circle here um, many of us weren't feeling very good. So the work got pushed out to many of these peripheral groups and we were simply briefed at the end of each day on what was happening in those teams. Now, George Mason University, no students returned to campus like many campuses um, in the US in the spring semester. Uh, we went fully online. And I would say that the educational experiences we produce, we, we provided for our students were less than optimal, right? We had many, many cases where, uh, like those of us who are um, baby boomers and older, um, we weren't sophisticated users of, the, of online platforms and the ability of our faculty to communicate well with, with strong pedagogy to their students in an online forum was not where it needed to be. However, during the spring semester, like as Scott described at Blue Cross Blue Shield, we began to implement a number of programs to help our faculty learn how to be more effective teachers in online platforms. And our faculty really responded to the challenge. 
um, sort of meeting uh, when they weren't in class with their students online, meeting with trainers that the university retained to help them be better utilize the technologies at their disposal and to um, think about how they develop curriculum better suited for online mechanisms. So as I said earlier, um, I started, I, in all of this chaos, I uh, handed in my resignation at George Mason University and accepted my new appointment at the University of Tennessee, um, an appointment I began August 1. Um, in August, one, uh, or in August, I should say, at the University of Tennessee, and these are University of Tennessee data that you see here, um, students came back to campus uh, the second, third, or third week of August. And what you see here is, and in this lower graphic and lower right hand graphic, you see the number of active cases for students and employees that emerged in August and September. And you see this really considerable spike in the number of cases that the university had and the largest this big spike here is driven by student positive cases um, so i arrived here just as the university was experiencing more or less what the northern virginia region experienced back in march and april um, as as uh, bob indicated i hadn't been here but a week or two and I again awoke one morning to an email message, this time from Chancellor Plowman, asking me if I would take responsibility for not all of the COVID testing at the university because most of the student testing is done by our student health center using conventional PCR nasal swab um, tests, um, but rather to be responsible for the university's sentinel testing program. So that was wastewater water epidemiology, so testing the wastewater in our residential facilities to detect traces of the virus and to, to help oversee our pool saliva testing. So we have two fabulous faculty members here at UT, um, experts in their respective fields who'd put together a test, who'd, who'd designed a testing program that the university hadn't yet implemented. Um, and that's what I was asked to accept responsibility for was to begin to implement that program. We didn't actually begin implementing the program until around here, when we were actually on the downward slope of the large increase in positive cases. So unfortunately, we didn't have it. We weren't, the labs weren't stood up to do that early in August, when I think we would have been able to predict the spike that later came. Um, to give you a sense of, of how that programming looked, so we have at the University of Tennessee about 8,000 students who live in what the CDC would call congregate settings. They live either in our Greek houses or in our residence halls. And we focused most of our sentinel testing, or all actually all of our sentinel testing, in our congregate settings, right? So in our residence halls and in our Greek houses. Um, we collect, collected saliva samples from students um, that we, whom we asked for saliva samples in the morning. Uh, those saliva samples would be tested in pools of five, and the results, whether a pool tested positive or negative for fragments of the coronavirus, would be given back to us by the end of the day. We'd be able to figure out which student samples had been in the positive pools, and those students were then asked to come in for uh, nasal swab testing the following day. Now, you have to see that um, most of the students who were diagnosed positive in this spike actually went to our student health center or to uh, one of the healthcare providers in the greater Knoxville area and asked for a test because they weren't feeling well or because they'd been identified as close contacts of someone who had been diagnosed positive. Our saliva testing program tests, tested or, and tests students who are feeling fine, who are asymptomatic and, and don't believe there's anything wrong with them. When we first began testing the first week of the program, um, about two and a half percent of the students who are all asymptomatic um, and who don't believe they've been in contact with anybody who's been diagnosed positive, turns out we're carrying the virus. 
Now, just like this, just like the decline in the number of positive cases diagnosed clinically through NP testing was declining uh, in late September, we saw a decline in the asymptomatic population. So by the end of the semester, so just before Thanksgiving, we were seeing positive rates in our community testing of about 1%. So dropped by more than, than 50% over that period of time. And that gave the university reasonable confidence that in fact, we had a sense of how much the virus was prevalent in our residential student population. Of course, we have twice as many students living off campus and participating in university programs. Um, and we didn't have the capacity in our labs to test all um, students living off campus. But what we were able to see was in this spike in active cases, um, we were able to see the number of students who were living on campus versus those who were living off campus. And actually the proportion of those testing positive was about the same as the proportion of stud students living on campus and off campus. So we didn't actually see a significant difference in the positive rates amongst those two student populations. And our hypothesis there, because we haven't been able to prove or disprove this, is that in fact, the virus was largely being transmitted socially in student settings where students were congregating together regardless of whether they were living on or off campus. We didn't see any significant difference in positive rates between dorms that had large communal bathrooms versus dorms that had um, you know, one or two students sharing a bathroom. So the sort of conclusion we drew was most of the transmission is occurring in community settings and not on the university campus because we had gone to significantly reduced um, large gatherings um, during the, the fall semester. I have here make critical small decisions, communicate, 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 communicate. And I think Scott did a great job of describing how important community testing, uh, communications, pardon me, is in this kind of scenario where you're always, you're always having to adapt to new information you're learning on the fly. Um, you know, we, we collected information, we pushed decision making out to teams at the edge of the network who were really engaged with our students um, during this period. And we learned so much things that uh, functions within the university that were that occurred within silos, those silo walls had to be broken down and, and um, groups brought together to address student needs during this very challenging time. We implemented a pause following the significant outbreak. We, we re we closed our, our dining halls. Students had to come and pick up their meals and go back to their dorms or, or other living uh, places where they live um, to eat, their, to eat their, their food. There was no longer an ability to, to eat in the dining halls. And we reduced and we significantly limited student interactions in the, dine, in the residence halls no more um, visitation is what we call it, no more visiting other students' rooms um, at any time in the day to try and limit transmission. And, and largely those, if, those um, actions limited uh, further transmission, as, as you can see in that slide. The chancellor, much like it, it sounds like the leader of Blue Cross Blue Shield um, did, implemented uh, at first, it was a, a semi-weekly presentation of Chancellor's COVID-19 updates, which she live streamed to keep the community informed about the data that was sort of coming in on a day-by-day -day basis and to let them know why the university was taking certain actions. Um, and we had a very, um, very well-coordinated communications campaign. We called it the Mask Up campaign to help our students understand and why they needed to participate in our Sentinel testing program, why it was important they mask up and wash their hands and so on. Um, because there was significant resistance to taking those actions amongst the community to begin with. 
Uh, we are planning for the future. We anticipate a spring semester, much like our fall semester, given that um, it doesn't seem likely that the majority of our campus population will be vaccinated before the end of our spring semester. Um, and we're, we're ramping up to do more testing on campus. So students will be tested more often in the spring semester to help us better sort of mitigate uh, virus transmission. And we've transitioned from sort of what was this sort of kitchen cabinet hub and spoke model with a limited number of response teams to this network of teams where decisions have really been pushed out to where the interactions are happening and where our employees are able to more effectively make decisions because they can act on the data in real time. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll close and invite any questions you might have uh, for Scott or for me. Thank you very much. Hi, Scott. This is Mike Ebbs. I just had a quick follow up on the chat. I work at the UT Health Science Center in Memphis. So you had mentioned that you have, uh, you'll have fewer people returning to the office. Is that because their permanent works station just per se will be at their home or they just be coming in less frequently to the office? So what I was referring to when I answered you in the chat was, uh, I was imagining a scenario where we're all vaccinated and we're, the world has restarted. Yeah. When that happens, because we let people choose, you, you know, we have about, uh, let me, I should have done the math on this. We had 2000. So we have another thousand people who have opted to stay home. And candidly, I think it's going to be more by the time we get there. So we just are going to have more room on our campus. We're going to have to, we're literally, as I mentioned, we've engaged a third party to study our campus usage. Um, I, things like maybe we institute a community room so that nonprofit groups can use some space or this kind of thing. But it, what I was referring to is people who are not coming back because they're working from home permanently. I see. And, and, and when you look at reconfiguring workspace, is it going to be more of like a hoteling type workspace scenario or those people actually will come back, will have a permanent space? So everyone, okay, we already have hoteling for people who can you telecommute. Um, I'm referring to the fact that we just have extra space. Uh, I, I can tell you that, well, uh, I have an education program. The reason I was in CTLI is we're working on, uh, uh, I think, a pretty unique education program and it, they'll be learning on site. And so uh, I have an institute that I'm standing up there that'll take up some of that space. But yeah, I was just describing a situation that we're going to have fewer people who come to work every day because they've chosen to work from home. Thanks for the clarification. Could, could you guys, you both use the term hoteling. Could somebody define that for us? When you have a work uh, from home person, sometimes they need to be in the office for meetings. Or we also, because we're statewide, we have people who come from Memphis, say, and they have some meetings for the week in Chattanooga. They need a place to set up and work just for a day or so. So we have places on every floor where you can just grab a cubicle and plug your computer in and go to work. It's called Angela over. Gibson. Um, I've got a question about um, workforce development. You know, as this pandemic has um, gone on, I've seen, I've read a few articles on LinkedIn that suggest that um, wor working remotely is great for your developed employees and your mid-level employees, uh, people or mid-career employees, um, but it's not necessarily great for developing the younger employees or the, I shouldn't say younger, but the um, beginning career employees. What are your ideas on that? Do you wanna go, Deborah? Sure. Um, so we have definitely, at the University of Tennessee, we have implemented a number of programs, sort of birds of a feather programs that bring together uh, faculty and staff who've started at the university in the last year or two and who have expressed, actually, this 
the, this action was motivated by a, a request, right? That people felt that they weren't able to connect with each other um, and with others whom they needed to connect um, outside of their narrower realm. Um, and so the university has put together these birds of a, of a feather sessions to try and address that, you know, what are the unique things that you're experiencing if you're a newer employee here, where you're not able to just, you know, pop next door and ask your colleague, because there's no, there's very few people here on campus. Um, and so the university is able to provide resources in that way. But I think that's a very that's a challenging problem for all organizations at the moment is sort of effective onboarding of new employees and then sort of providing that connectivity for them that they ordinarily would have had because they would have been in a physical place able to meet other colleagues much more readily. I'll answer in two parts. Prior to the pandemic, we had a policy that even if you knew when you came that you were going to be working remotely, you had to work, I believe it was six months on campus, again, to establish that culture. And then you could transition to, to work from home full time. I don't know what we're going to do post pandemic, mm -hmm. because I believe, I don't know that the pandemic, okay, I believe the pand pandemic is accelerating things. And I, it's accelerated the work from home movement. And I think it's gonna feel differently. I think it's answering a lot of the fears about whether you can be effective and work from home. So I don't have an answer, but I won't be surprised if you can start at our company and not do that a year from now because um, my partner works for a tech company in New York and he you know, works here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Never did work on their campus. I think it's just changing ideas about what, what culture means. For me as a communicator who's charged with internal communication and keeping that bond, my team is rethinking, like we have all kinds of free lunch on campus and you know all these activities that, go, that have gone on over the years and free handouts and jackets and hats. And I have to rethink that because now I'll, I would have to mail everything to 55% of my employees. Anything I do, I can't just hand out right at an event so i'm having to rethink everything about what culture means and how i keep that engaged so um yeah to be continued how we deal with that but um i won't be surprised if the if it looks differently after this than it did before Deborah, I want to ask you about the use of the small teams. And Scott, you may want to uh, piggyback on this as well. Uh, when we study agile leadership or resilient leadership, uh, there is a lot of value put on those teams of six uh, or so who are empowered to make the decisions. And that seems to be exactly the model that uh, you used here. So what do you do about those faculty members or those other administrators who feel that they've been left out of where the decision making exists? And when you did that, you had to cross structures. So you pretty much abandoned the hierarchical uh, ways of forming those teams. That's, that's a great question. Um, I, and a great observation, Bob. I, I, that's certainly one of the lessons I took away from this is sort of the power of small empowered teams who actually have to go out and interact with, gather information from a much larger community of colleagues, right? So to some extent, those those small teams are responsible for aggregating the information they collect and figuring out which is the most important information to both share and act upon. Um, and we had, in almost every case, those small teams are cross-functional teams and they've actually sort of revealed for us things that we will do post-pandemic right, that could never have happened in the past because those people were never in rooms together. 
Um, and so, you know, the value of that, of the approach to sort of managing this constantly changing situation, I think will be felt for many years to come because we've learned how to do things differently. That certainly at Mason, um, that approach to that sort of networked approach to managing a problem was far from our culture, right? We were a command and control institution and the kitchen cabinet made decisions and they rolled them out. Um, so, you know, we learned a lot in this process. Um, boy, where to begin? So we have cross-cultural teams. I'm a part of three related to the pandemic. Our top leadership always has met, right? So they meet regularly. There's probably eight or nine of them. But during the pandemic, because of illness or the potential, each of them had to name a second. So I started attending my boss as the chief communication officer. And so I started attending that meeting remotely uh, in case he became ill. So oddly, our small team <laughs> doubled, but since it was all remote, it was fine and has been a really good thing because there have been issues. Um, secondly, we formed a communication SWAT team in February, and that is a cross-functional small team to make, but it had to represent, it's not just communicator, it's communicators from all the lines of business, commercial, government, legal, you know, so that we could get together and hammer out what needs to be done. And it was up to you to make sure your boss was informed because we had to implement quickly. And thirdly, once we were remote and functioning fine, um, and our customer service levels, by the way, stayed in the high 90s throughout all of this, um, we started a, a small team related to return to work, which I was referring to in the chat. Um, and that was, again, so mostly different people from across the line of business of what's it going to be like when we return? How do we return? And what's the campus look like? So I know that sounds like a lot of small teams, but that's, that's how we did it. And we were each empowered. Um, I had to make sure my boss was okay with everything, but um, the, the third team was, uh, had a longer timeline and it keeps getting longer, but that's how we handled it. Um, you know, we're a corporation. We're kind of used to working that way. Um, and what I will say is, uh, thanks to leadership from the top, those lines of communication were already working well and they've served us well during this crisis. Well, we're running out of time, but if there are other questions. Uh... I, was, I was curious about one thing. I'll try to uh, say it quickly. So clearly there's a segment of employees that haven't had the opportunity to work at home just based upon the nature of their responsibilities and duties, uh, especially in, in research, uh, at research and education center where animal care and, and a whole lot of facility maintenance and things like that are an important part of what they have to do. So I'm kind of curious uh, what sort of strategies or approaches you may have found effective to help you know, those, that class of employees to still feel a value part of the community of the workforce, but, you know, clearly aren't benefiting from that option to work at home or not to work at home. Um, just kind of curious if you could share any thoughts about some effective strategies that you may have uh, come across that helps appease and make that segment of the workforce feel like they're important um, even though they can't work at home during face of the pandemic and things. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to address that. So, of course, the university has a number of folks, as, as you described in research, and in also many of the functions that support our student population. And these folks continue to, to come to campus almost every day, if not every day. Um, and some of the things that we've been doing are sort of um, recognizing the contributions that staff are making. We have uh, uh, some folks who are, are hosting pop-in lunches where uh, staff can come and get, instead of having what might have been a brown bag lunch or a catered lunch in the past, they can come and pick up their lunch. There's, the lunches are being provided by, by several of the university leaders. They come and pick them up and there's a little chance they're, they're 
time synced so that we don't have too many people in a room at the same time, but it just gives the opportunity for that personal touch and that personal interaction and sort of ability to say thank you. Many of the staff who support our students um, feel very strongly that they want to be at work every day, right? And, and in most cases, their jobs in those cases require it. Um, and so it's just those communications from the chancellor saying thank you to certain groups. We appreciate everything you do. Um, being, being willing to hear those employees and help them, uh, have them help us understand the actions that need to be taken to make their um, day to day responsibilities easier to fulfill. Um, I think those are mainly the mechanisms that we've been using at UT. But you know, they are the heroes of the university this semester, there's no doubt about it. Well, I knew that we would run over because I, knowing both of you and the, the content that you provided for us. So I want to express our gratitude, Scott. Thank you very, very much for your becoming part of the University of Tennessee, man. Uh, and we want to welcome you to it. And to uh, Deborah, welcome to the University of Tennessee and welcome particularly to the Executive Leadership Institute. You're surrounded in your office by people who are associated with this program. I want to thank all of you who participated in this. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, you may have noticed that we have uh, one scheduled next week, which I have no idea how that is going to work. Uh, Lori and uh, David will be our facilitators. And those of you who know those two people, or even just one of those two people, know that this is going to be a fun ride. So with that, uh, thank you very, very much, Scott and Deborah. Uh, we are indebted to you for the advice that you've given us and we'll move it forward as part of our leadership development. With that, I'm gonna close off. Okay. Enjoyed it, thanks very much. Bye. Happy holidays. Thank you. Bye.